we have a terrific, terrific uh, topic for you today. Um, we are going to hear from Megan Gurka of AIM Institute for Learning and Research and Tony Okarma from the school district, who are together going to review a recent symposium that AIM provided. And AIM, again, Institute for Learning and Research is really committed to getting the research on reading instruction out into the field and out to practitioners. They've been doing these for 11 years. I know I've gone to 11 of them and um, always have the leading researchers of the field and a very compelling topic. And the topic this time was, I think you've all seen it, why is comprehension so hard to comprehend? And um, I'll just say uh, um, the big takeaway from my perspective was that the National Reading Panel identified five pillars. They said, okay, it's phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, oh, and comprehension. <laughs> and, but comprehension is made up of many, many sub skills. And um, the researchers really went into some interesting insights and um, background on actually the fact that you need significant background knowledge in order to be an effective comprehender. So this is vital for our students and their progress in learning to read. And instead of being there all day for six hours, we get the benefit of having Megan and Tony synthesize this for us in an hour. So let me turn it over to you. Thanks so much for being here, both of you. We are so excited to be here and I would love to take the opportunity to let my lovely colleague, Tony, introduce herself. She is a rock star and a pioneer in this work in the schools every day. Tony, tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Hi, uh, I am very excited to be here. My name is Tony Okarma. I am a director of uh, curriculum and instruction in English language arts for the school district of Philadelphia. Um, and I see some very familiar faces on here. So hi, friends. Um, <laughs> we've been trying to get this work in um, based in science of reading going for the last four years. And we've been working with AIM for the past 10 years. And we're making traction. And it's so exciting. So I'm so excited to share everything with you today. Megan? Awesome. Great introduction. I love it. I love that you're in the schools every day making this happen for the kiddos. I know you had a very long weekend working. I know uh, we had shared and chatted about that before we started, but hi, everybody. My name is Megan Garica. I am at the AIM Institute. I'm a fresh face at the AIM Institute, if you're familiar with our work. I just joined the team in June after a decade in public schools. So I've been an elementary teacher, a speech and debate team coach. So if anybody wants to debate, that's also a very big passion. Um, love linguistics, K-12, to reading specialist, as well as an instructional coach. And today we are here to talk to you and recap this amazing symposium. So if you're not familiar with AIM, uh, a couple big things to keep in mind. First, you're going to see a couple little icons on the screen. Read by fourth, which is how you got connected to here, as well as School District of Philadelphia. We are, as an institution, believe so strongly and passionately about the power of partnerships. So anytime, whether your organization, your school, even you as an individual, we would love to reach out and connect with you in any way. Here at AIM, our goal is to transform and empower lives through literacy, which is kind of how this whole symposium started. We wanted to get the research that has been there and been around for decades into the classroom. So we collaborate with top people in the field. And at our symposium this past time, we got to see some of those top faces. So you'll see here on the screen, our lovely moderator, Nancy Hennessy, which is gonna serve as kind of the framework, her big model, the framework for our talk today. You're also gonna see Hugh Katz, who is with the Florida Center. You're gonna see Amy Elman, Laura Cutting, doing great work on some of the neuroscience. You're also going to see um, Kristen Nguyen, as you're familiar with Mississippi and the incredible work they've been doing for years. She served and helped us kind of frame our minds around implementation and coaching cycles. So you'll get all of that in this big recording. We're here today just to kind of smash it all together, give you the high level overview, but we're definitely going to encourage you to check out that recording. Maybe that'll be like a dinner and dive into it later, but this is just that quick high level overview. So why are we here? 
Nancy, I love that you brought up those big pillars because, you know, once we thought of comprehension being that one pillar, people thought it was just this tiny little thing that we can quickly address through a couple bit of strategy instruction. And we're finding out that that old archaic way of instructing comprehension wasn't successful. Here on the screen, you can see our NAEP data. Um, you've probably been to 100 presentations about NAEP data, but I want you to realize and recognize that the pandemic had lasting consequences. Up here on the screen, you see the 25th and the 10th percentile of learners, students who were struggling readers before the pandemic. We saw them drop five and six percentage points on the NAEP test this year. And that's telling us that our lower performing students were hit the hardest. So our work and the importance of accelerating reading acquisition as well as comprehension is more important than ever. So, so excited to be here. And we know a lot about reading. Tony, what do we know? <laughs> well, we know what Dr. Har Hollis Scarborough has taught us with her reading rope about the two strands. And you know, trying to move this work forward in the school district, we of course started with our youngest learners and the, the word recognition strands. And we started hearing, well, the science of reading is just about decoding and phonics and sounding out words. And we're like, no, it's much more than that, right? So we, we've got to attack these upper strands as well often say that when kiddos are in the lower grades that they are uh, learning to read and then when you move to the upper grades you're reading to learn it's not exactly true our kids are always reading to learn so my co-workers here behind me doing snaps because she totally agrees with that as well so um yeah so we're always working on all strands of the reading rope and what we're trying to do is everything that we, we got from this symposium, all of this great research, all of these great ideas, how are we now going to bring it to teachers in the classroom? Megan? That's a really great point. And if you ever have the opportunity to come visit us at AIM, you will see that huge giant rope up there. AIM specializes in students uh, with dyslexia and tier three language-based disorders. And we can see on this quadrants, it's not just a dyslexia movement. This is probably familiar to some of you, maybe not familiar to others, but you'll notice that reading rope, we kind of broke into two areas here, word recognition and language comprehension. When we were working with Tiffany Hogan, one of our key presenters, she wanted us to really talk about that bottom area when we have students who are struggling with that language side of the reading rope. And she talked about how we have dyslexia awareness days and advocacy days all around the country, and it's becoming more of a common term, but rarely do we talk about developmental language disorder or DLD. This might be familiar to some of you. What do you call it in a school district to Philadelphia? I think you said you call it um, specific language impairment, SLD, right, Tony? It's the, yeah, we call it an SLD. Yeah, so those terms that you hear in those labels help us qualify for services, but really that kind of umbrella term is this idea of developmental language disorder. And it's just like dyslexia, you're born with it, it persists across a lifetime, and we do see a brain difference. And that does make it more difficult to understand vocabulary as well as grammar. And we really have to make sure we're more aware and start to use this terminology. She has a really great podcast. Um, we'll definitely link it in the chat by the end, but really kind of drilling home this advocacy piece with DLD. So all that in mind, you know, we know why we're here. We know how reading develops and we know kind of profiles for students who struggle with reading, especially comprehension. But how does a student start to interact with text? Assuming that they have great decoding skills and we fill that lower part of the strand of the rope, how do they start to access text? Well, Nancy Hennessy was our amazing moderator, and she, in her book, Reading Comprehension Blueprint, it is a staple if you don't have it, such a great read for teachers. In this book, she talks about this framework called the mental model and how a reader interacts with text and the different language processes and different skills to move from the surface level all the way through the mental model. So each of these pieces, starting at that word level, moving to sentences, and this was kind of a huge missing link, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, 
I used to think that they would just pull words from a passage and then jump right into that text and think that they would kind of make those connections. You know, I have a lot of fallacies and a lot of things I have to confront when I started to become familiar with this work myself. But it happens in this progression and it's bi-directional, meaning that as students are acquiring words, grappling with them in those complex texts and complex sentence structures, adding in that background knowledge, it's kind of this facilitative integrative process. So fancy pants words, but what does that mean? Let's start with vocab. What do we know about academic vocabulary? I love this uh, part of the presentation from Dr. Amy Elman because she said that vocabulary is really just a proxy. And for many teachers, including myself, I used to think that we would pull out vocabulary words in isolation and just teach them to the end, just keep pulling out those random words and hoping they acquire them. And really she talked about this importance of contextualizing vocabulary, not only in sentences, but also in the text they read as well as understanding how much knowledge plays a key role in this. And we know that research shows equivocally how important vocabulary is, especially for our English learners, but they need that knowledge piece to help facilitate that. So she cited a study um, in a classroom, it was a preschool classroom, and she talked about this need to build semantic networks. So Tony, what is this study? What did they learn? So by... Um by attaching all of this information, it grows the syntax in, in children's brain. We often come away thinking that children have vocabulary deficits when in fact it's not a vocabulary deficit, but it's a, a knowledge deficit. And if we grow the knowledge base, then we have so much more vocabulary. And what she talked about is just doing a brief you know, usually when we build background, we kind of like sometimes jump right in or sometimes we take a whole day to introduce background. And what she's saying is if we do just a brief 10 minute background building to activity to activate some of that knowledge and to build some knowledge onto what kids already come to us with, then it grows so much more and the, the comprehension piece becomes so much deeper. Absolutely. And you can do this already with preschool students. So when Tony said, you know, we don't read to learn till later, they're listening, they're understanding, and we're starting to build those networks right away. Preschool students. I mean, if any of you have little kiddos at home, you're doing it right off the bat. Here's a way that we can kind of facilitate some of those networks to kind of help vocabulary to stick to that knowledge. And that was a really resounding element in this work. So like I shared, that's a tiny piece of vocabulary, but it was a really big takeaway when Tony and I were preparing for this for you guys. What about sentences? So think about how we talk, how I talk. I'm saying y'all, I have some of that Georgia twang in there. Um, but sentences that we encounter in our oral language are a lot different than the sentences students are encountering in academic text. Pull up a book, you'll realize very quickly that how you converse with your friends, even how you converse with your teachers, how Tony and I were chatting last Friday is a lot different than the text that they're encountering because sentence structures are so dense, they vary in length, and there's a lot of different connectives that occur in sentences in print and word that we don't often see in our oral language because we have some of, you know, facial features and dramatic pauses that students don't necessarily see in text at hand. So building a lot more of those semantic networks as well through sentence comprehension can be really powerful. And here's an, again, another great example. I know we are pulling just a couple key takeaways, but this was another great example using the text Henry and Mudge. We really wanted to draw home that this starts very early on. What's happening up here, Tony? What are they doing? So we're looking at characteristics, features. And with that, also developing vocabulary, right? We're saying pointed ears, floppy ears, large and hefty. Like these are, these are, this is the vocabulary that's embedded with what we're talking about when we're talking about a book about Henry and his best friend Mudge, right? So we can, we can build all of that right in here and doing it. And look at the names of the dogs that we're talking about, yet they're also photographs of dogs. So we're supporting our learners because they can also look at the photographs. 
Absolutely. And think about all of the great sentence structure that you can build just to start to facilitate that comprehension activity. So those vocab words are there. We're learning about categories of dogs. And now we're taking it a step further. What do the sentences say about dogs? How can we kind of categorize that idea as well? Um, if you're familiar with any of our work at AIM, we do a lot of work with sentence parsing, sentence deconstruction, and that can be used for younger learners as well as older learners to really break down some of that really complex language that's happening there. Now, this is like the meat and potatoes, Tony. Wouldn't you agree? Like, this was like the meat of our work here, of this symposium. I don't know about you, but it really um, caused me to dive deep into it. And I've gone down a rabbit hole since uh, the symposium, reading more about it. <laughs> we love rabbit holes. Anybody wants to hang out with Tony and I after, you know, like I said, dinner and dive in, we're here. <laughs> we love this work, but background knowledge was a resounding element and theme in the work that we do. And some of the things that we're going to show you as Tony shared might be very affirming. And you're like, yeah, I do that. Or I understand the importance of that. And some of it might be like, oh, wow, I might have to make a little adjustment here. And that definitely was a takeaway for me. One of the things that Hugh Katz uh, made sure to share was that as we're talking about the science of reading and this big movement, we have to keep in mind the science of learning and how that really facilitates this background knowledge process. So on the screen here is a little girl reading a text, but he really wanted us to drive home that they're not making meaning just from the text at hand. All of that meaning is coming from their mind and how they're integrating all of these elements from the text, from that vocab, from background knowledge of all of those categories, from the sentence structure and how they were able to break that down. That's all occurring in the mind. And he said that a lot of this great work with background knowledge is also really a powerful motivator too, because students are innately curious about things that they don't know. He cited a lot of work with Carpenter. I think they've done a study in 2021. Don't quote me on that. Ask you. <laughs> um, but he really talked about how curiosity is that mediator. And the science of learning really supports curiosity. And he also shared uh, something that I loved is reading is a thinking activity. So it's like thinking with a book in your hand. And I really loved that. The other thing he shared is our little brains, our working memory can handle four bits of information at one time. And that's on a good day. I mean, it is lunch and learn and I haven't even eaten yet. So I could probably handle three bits of information at one time. Uh, think about your students. You know, you never know what they're coming with. Our brains can only handle so much at one time. So building this knowledge is going to be really, really powerful to facilitate that process. To kind of talk about how this is a thinking activity, we wanted you to go ahead and read this quick little passage on the screen. This came from Hugh Katz. Give you a minute. Give me like nice eyes or a smile so I know you're done. <laughs> Fancy smiling. That's a good sign. <laughs> Alex is giving me that smile. Okay. So one of the things that he really mentioned is as it's a thinking activity, here we are making sense of vocab. What is a procedure? What are steps? What could this be talking about? Making all of those syntactical connections. And we didn't even so much as read the title yet. <laughs> and we learned so much about how text structure, teaching students to pay attention, even as something as silly as a title, is going to play a critical role in facilitating that thinking activity of background knowledge. The other thing that was a huge takeaway for me was this slide right here. I mean, I saw so many people snapping photos of this slide. That for so long, we thought, hey, these younger generations, they've got Google, they are fine. They have Siri, they have Alexa, they'll be fine. They can just ask them. And Hugh really wanted to draw home, he cites a great study up here with Ward, that we didn't realize how important it was to have that background knowledge in our long-term memory. Because remember, we're only holding on to four bits at a time. If we're Googling or asking Alexa we're not gonna have enough mental bandwidth to be able to focus on the task at hand. 
And uh, Tony, I know you love to talk about the baseball study when we share this. So you want to share a little bit about that great landmark study? Yes. Um, and I, some of you may be familiar with this, but there were groups of children who were asked to read passage, a passage about baseball. Um, the children who knew more about baseball yet were not as great readers actually scored better on comprehension questions than better readers who didn't know anything about baseball. So it just once again shows the importance of having to have that background knowledge and bringing some knowledge in order to better understand that text. Because if you go back to the passage that Megan had up, I don't think anybody had any trouble re reading, right? Saying any of the words that were in that passage. And, you know, probably by the end of first grade, beginning of second grade, um, I think a, a lot of our kiddos would be able to read the words in that passage. We didn't know what the context was, right? So that made so much difference. And when, when I read it, I had no idea what it was about. And then I saw the title. Now I can't not know it, right? So I, I, I'm like, oh, how did I not know that the first time I was going in to read it? So doing this, um, a simple task like this with teachers really allows them to see what their kiddos are seeing. So well said. And we often didn't realize how important that knowledge and those integrative processes were. And even with the idea of baseball, I know when I was first teaching, I used to send home, you know, that getting to know you survey and I would check what students' interests were. And I would try to only find texts on those interests to get them excited. And while that excitement is very important, of course, to build those relationships with our students, we want to make sure we're building their knowledge and expanding it in those arts, in the sciences, in humanities, so that they have a bank of information to draw on when they encounter those texts and have to start to do a little bit more work with them. All that in mind, the internet, the words, the sentences, the syntax, this all plays a role in getting this coherent representation of text. And it is so much more than just a single skill here or there. And all of these elements have to work seamlessly together for students to have a real true understanding of what that text is. Any of these little areas can cause a trip up and cause a breakdown in this whole process. So now let's shift a little bit to instruction the last few minutes. Beyond just knowledge building, what are we gonna do, Tony? Beyond just Given them all that great knowledge, what are we going to do? We need to model. And it, but it just can't end there, right? We see teachers modeling, 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 and then hand it off to their kiddos. There are some who can do it and some not yet. We're often missing a piece. We're missing the guided practice piece, right? So we, we need to make sure that that's included. So there's a difference between a teacher telling something and modeling it versus the teacher thinking aloud. So those are the types of things when we go into classrooms that we're trying to help, uh, trying to promote and help teachers to do with their kiddos. So well said. And we often forget how many of those we do's and you do's that our students really need when making sense of this. Um, also like shout out IDA principles of effective instruction. That's explicit instruction. Love it. <laughs> Such a great definition. Um, but we want to make sure we're teaching those fundamental skills. We're facilitating yeah. language early, even if they're not encountering it in text yet. It's coming from you as the educator, you as the parent, you as someone on the street, you're facilitating language. And of course we want to keep that cognitive engagement sharp and strong because curiosity is a really strong motivator. So this was probably a big question we got going in. Well, what about all those strategies, main idea, this, that, the other thing? Elman did great service to this question. She said that those strategies are actually pretty important, um, but we're spending way too much time on them in the classroom. So spending much less time and really keeping in mind our goal. So as our students are engaging in these complex texts, our goal is for them to extract meaning, not to learn just an isolated strategy. And that was very well known, even with the baseball study, 
you're going to be able to identify the main idea of something you know a lot about chances are you're not going to be able to identify the main idea of something you don't have a lot of that knowledge, a lot of vocab, a lot of comprehension of, you know, in sentence and between sentence ties. So strategy instruction has a place, maybe pull back a little bit on some of that time. So what does this mean for you all that are here? So let's talk a little piece about things we're going to stop and things we're going to do. So I'm going to be the naysayer here, right? I'm going to be the no, take this out. Tony's going to be my, the better half. Okay. Tony's going to be my green light. <laughs> so what are we going to stop in our classrooms? Um, one of the things that we're going to really make sure we stop is stop using decodables and levels to teach comprehension, to teach that deep comprehension. Decodable text has a place, of course, in that lower strand of the rope. But when we're talking about this comprehension process, we want to make sure you're using grade level complex text. Um, definitely check out Hugh Katz and Elman did a lot of great service to this. There's also Tim Shanahan wrote a really great blog just a few days ago, all about this exact conversation. So definitely check that out. Also stop teaching comprehension as if it's just this single skill that we're going to work on main idea all this week and they're going to master main idea and they'll never have to do it again. It's not this single skill. What are we going to do, Tony? What are we going to do better? Well, we're really going to focus on developing knowledge and expertise through integrating our curricula. And we want to make sure we're teaching strategies like inferencing because that's what's going to go deep within the text. Okay, uh, Megan, just to say something about your stop using decodables and level text, right? We know that decodables have their place in early literacy, they're, but their purpose is not the same. We, can, we could never go deep and do the comprehension work, that, the comprehension work, the thinking work that we want to do with that decodable text. Okay, and we, we try to make that clear and we try to make that distinction when we're coaching. Absolutely. Think about your goal of your instruction. And thank you so much, Tony. Perfect. So what about assessment? This is also a hot question. You know, you're getting ready. You're going to that MTSS meeting. What are we going to do for assessment? Stop measuring it as if it's a single thing. Um, when Hugh Katz did his presentation, he wanted to, you know, get rid of the nape when they talk about this idea of comprehension and how it really has so much to do with the, their contextual understanding of the subject at hand. So while I don't think that's going to happen, what we can do is stop assuming that those one shots of reading tests, especially at the state and national level, are going to give us a lot of instructional validity. So just keep that in mind and don't use those single tests for diagnostics. What can we do, Tony? Well, we, we want to make sure that we're assessing our children's abilities on specific comprehension text task scenarios, right? So it matters. The text matters. The text is at the center. And stop thinking it's I'm teaching comprehension or I'm teaching this. Oh, and I'm going to do it through this text. Text matters. We're going to select educationally relevant comprehension activities. Um, we came back to the office after this, and we were we had a discussion ab about stuff that you cats was saying about you know the standardized test and and how they do that. We can't work around that right now. That is what it is, but we need to teach our kids to use that that text and pull from there text matters. So, so well said, Tony. And honestly, our big end takeaway is that reading comprehension isn't something that you teach. It's not something that you're just going to pick up and say, this is reading comprehension time. It is something you are going to create through this mental model, through all of these processes. So we strongly encourage you to check out the symposium. We're definitely going to have some great discussions. We had a great hashtag, so check out our hashtag. I just pulled a couple uh, little snapshots from our symposium. So we would love for you to join us next year, virtual, in-person, watch party. We had watch parties in the Philippines. We had watch parties in Atlanta. It was awesome. Tell us about it. We want to share in that learning with you. 
If you want to check out all of the great recordings, um, you can go ahead and scan this QR code. I'm also going to put it in the chat for you now. Right there. And you are welcome to, it'll ask you for your email um, name, and then we'll just send out that recording for you. We also wanted you to know that next year we're focusing all on the intersection of reading and writing. So if you're familiar with the SRSD work that's happening, that big government grant and that huge study that's undertaking, we're there to talk and deconstruct what's going on in the writing world. So Katie Pace Miles is going to be our facilitator. She is a dear friend of AIM, fantastic work. She talks so much about the reach of the research and how it can really facilitate this process. So you're also welcome to register or save the date. Um, we'll send out information as it comes available. We would love to have you in March. And I think our big takeaway, I think, Alex, we're ready to talk to our people. We want to hear what they had to say about these takeaways. Excellent. We are ready to open it up for discussion and questions. Reactions discussion, questions. <laughs> okay, it's like one of those don't everybody talk at once time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I agree wholeheartedly with, um, with what I heard. I believe that comprehension, the earlier, the better, you know, through conversations. And what I try to tell parents and whoever will listen is just have those conversations. And they don't have to know that they're planned and that we are imparting this knowledge and also experiences. The more experiences that we can expose our little ones to and they're picking up new vocabulary and it's exciting. When they hear it again, it's not going to be brand new. It's going to be something that helps them connect dots to new learning. So I, I wholeheartedly believe that the more that we connect with children, we talk to them, and I give, I give questions, I ask children questions. That's what I promote, ask them, you know? And even if they get 99.9 .9 wrong, it's okay. We're gonna give you the answers. We're gonna talk about it. And that's not cheating, that's introducing new knowledge. So thank you so much for what you do. I'd like to jump in, first of all, Tony and Megan, thank you. That was a fabulous recap of a whole day of tremendous information. Um, I've heard it said, and I love this statement and I'd like to hear your reaction to it. Actually, particularly in K to three, we're teaching reading or comprehension all day long. It's in social studies, it's in art, it's in science, it's in, there's always an opportunity. So sort of this idea that we're teaching reading all day long, we're teaching some specific skills during ELA, um, but we need to have the mindset that it is all day. Can you just comment on that? Absolutely, Nancy. We believe so wholeheartedly in that, that last year we developed our own units in the school district of Philadelphia and they are integrated units. Right. So, um, you know, we we talk about um, animals in a unit and animal habitats. So we're delving into the science piece of it. We're delving into the social studies piece of it. We're delving into um, all of Dr. Goldie Muhammad's um, five. Um, and I just lost the word against okay. her, her five pursuits. Thank you. Her five pursuits. I knew it was a P word. Um, so our, our units go along with that, right? So we're building knowledge throughout the day and we're trying to do the, those semantic connections, those, all that syntax, all that semantics work. We're trying to push that all together. And it's, it's hard, right? It's, it's, it's a change in practice for people, but we know it's what's best for kiddos. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback on that. And as, yeah, we'll check that out. Um, and just to highlight that all day goes beyond the school day. Like it's super exciting to hear kind of how the work has evolved locally. But one thing that's been striking me in doing some statewide um, work is that there's a huge untapped potential within our out of school time. Um, and especially with all the stimulus dollars coming out. 
Um, and so there's been, you know, work when Philly used to have, you know, different training options for our youth development providers um, around like, you know, uh, there's a huge role for comprehension and engagement, particularly for English learners when we have the more fun, you know, times that can happen outside. And so I'm, this is super helpful to think about how to distill out key points for those audiences. Um, because I think, you know, when I first started going to the science reading training, it's like, oh shoot, we're not supposed to like do the three code queuing, whatever. I've trained so many like teens to help younger kids with that. And, you know, so then what are, okay, more vocab, but what are we supposed to do? So this is really helpful to put that in context. And I think one thing that's really resonated, um, today and otherwise is that the huge role of background knowledge. And so we used to do trainings with after school folks back in the center for youth development days at United Way. Um, where we talked about project-based learning and mapping, you know, doing a an, an, uh, theme on the sea. Uh, and it was always kind of like, well, that's nice, but I think there's like added importance to that, um, that there's so many of the extension activities. Um, so I think there's really exciting opportunities for alignment because so many providers, especially in Philly, are doing literacy work. So I hope to see more of this out in those worlds too. But thank you all for bringing some great uh, energy and insights to helping figure out like, okay, what do we do? I, I know the rope, but like, what does that mean uh, for our different type of informal educators as well? Well, while you're talking, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Nancy shared, how reading comprehension is really everywhere. This is another amazing book. I know you might be familiar with another Sunflower book, the multi-sensory book. That is another like reading the best, but this book is all about vocabulary. And I would say like the big chunk and chew of this book is tier two words have so much uh, linguistic like utility. So you can analyze something in reading. You can analyze something in math. You can analyze something in science. You can analyze something on the playground. So being able to use some of those tier two words and picking out those tier two words when we're reading uh, to really kind of bridge those bridge subject areas and bridge that vocab knowledge and apply it elsewhere. Thank you. Damien, you got a question? A reaction? We don't hear you. Or I don't hear you. Maybe you're there. Looks like you're unmuted, but couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can. Man, okay, beautiful. Um, so again, I wanted to say it was a great presentation, very informative. It provides an interesting way to take a, a different look at reading comprehension, but it immediately made me think about how we can use this to leverage more support from parents and families at home and helping them understand that because reading comprehension is a continuum, they need to understand the value of ensuring that they are providing the right resources at home to support reading comprehension outside of the classroom. Um, so I just love the idea of thinking about it as a continuum, not looking at it from a from a diagnostic, you know, singular test skill set perspective, but something that young people are going to develop over the course of their lives, but by extension, that gets enhanced by their by what they experience outside of a school classroom and outside of a, a school building. Family is our soul. So important to all the work that we do. And I think COVID um, really help families to see and get more involved in our schools, uh, which has been such a huge blessing too. So thank you for really bringing that point home for us. I love that. Any other takeaways? Jill, go ahead. I think of two things. I'm no longer associated with an agency, but have been involved with adult education and early literacy. When working with adult education, adult learners, I remember asking, why do you think schools go to the zoo? And everything, oh, it was a day off, it was something out of class, and starting to help people understand that seeing a tiger at the zoo helps people, helps the students understand what a tiger is in the book. So there was that piece of it. The other piece, I spent an evening with a bunch of folks who were educators, and one was a STEM educator who was bemoaning the fact that there wasn't enough emphasis on learning math and arithmetic. A lot of people don't even know what arithmetic is and talking about maths. And I wish I'd had more of this information to say, well, this, you're learning reading comprehension 
while you're doing the math and the arithmetic. And that's definitely a part of what you need to be aware of. And I just couldn't really convey how um, uh, this continuum of learning outside what, what um, the previous speaker, Damien, was saying about learning outside the classroom and bringing that into the classroom and having that across the curriculum and not just within um, language arts. So thank you for providing me with a larger context for being able to talk about that. Such a great takeaway too. It's not just the science of reading, it's really the science of learning. How do we learn? How do adults learn? How do students learn? What works best? Cognitive load theory. I mean, Jill, anytime you want to chat all that stuff, I love it. <laughs> but I do work. Um, there's another great book I'd love to recommend. Dr. Stephen Shaw wrote a really good book called Reaching and Teaching Students Who Don't Qualify for Special Education. And he has an entire chapter on there about the importance of concreteness, even when we're building knowledge. So being able for them to actually see a visual or an tiger in person is so critical and also being able to connect it to the relevance of the work. So um, I remember when I taught in kindergarten, I was co-teaching CKLA and we were doing the war of 1812. Well, what does that mean for students that are sitting right here in the class right now? What did that war do for them? And, you know, how does that pertain to how governments are set up and the kind of governments and rules they see in school? So being able to make those connections is really powerful. Nancy, I see you have a takeaway. Other names. There you go. Uh, Nancy Quinn. Hi. Nancy Quinn. Okay. Let's do it. A little old fashioned here. We still have a landline, so it was ringing behind me. But, um, but anyway, um, I just wanted to say, you know, I agree with Tony. I, I had heard that analogy, the baseball analogy, and I think that is just so powerful. And, you know, putting that together with da Damon's idea of, you know, extending uh, learning and, and experience outside the classroom, how important it is to, again, tell the parents about these how important it is to take kids someplace to experience things to read to them to have that background because it really is bringing that all together which is just um you know so so powerful but I, I agree I thought that study was just amazing and how we can you know just tie together what they're learning in school and also with home environment as well I'm gonna add in an amazing thing so um I grew up in DC area so I'm going to drop something in the chat. So all those great field trip experiences are amazing. And another silver lining of COVID is that these amazing museums all created online free virtual tours. So one of my favorites that I check out is Smithsonian has their entire uh, natural history tours, all their exhibits online. You can go in, you can interact, you can hear that complex vocabulary, you can see it so much great um, interactive tours online. So even if you don't have the ability to drive somewhere or go somewhere, there's so much access, you know, right here, Google Earth. Virtual tours are really powerful. And we will definitely send out um, after the session a list of um, these books and resources that, uh, that you all have mentioned. So just wanted to make a note about that. Terrific. <laughs> You know, I wanted to um, just uh, emphasize the point. I can't remember which of the researchers said, you know, testing reading comprehension as a just a test like the NAEP or the PSSA is very, very limited. It's not something that just at one point in time you can tell. And it reminds me that I was working um, <clears throat> years ago in New York and the eighth grade test was a passage about snowboarding. It's, are, did the kids struggle with it because they had never been snowboarding and they didn't know anything about snowboarding or did they struggle with it because they don't have good inferential thinking skills? I think it's pretty obvious that it's a experience and background knowledge um, situation, but I, uh, I do think it's important to be skeptical of the value. It, these tests are important, but they're they're not really helping us with instruction in what the children need. Jill, I love it. You got the emoji and the hand. This is because <laughs> I wasn't sure the emoji was making it through. 
Um, you talked about at the beginning how the pandemic and poor readers skills dropped dramatically. And I, I know that in a general sense, but is there a way that you can identify some of the things that really hurt the students? Was it lack of socialization, lack of when you're talking about the museum having uh, online experiences for kids, could they not access it? I just, what are some of the elements that, that harmed them? You know, I could, you know, ask and kind of come up with my own opinions on that after teaching virtually and seeing the inequities. Um, I remember I was teaching and I had a student who was in a Turkey Hill, which is a gas station faculty room because her mom was working and that's where she had to do virtual school. And then I had another student on the other end of the district who had an indoor pool and that was his background. So the inequities were just alarming. Um, not only in terms of internet access to online resources, as well as parents um, who are busy working and had some of those frontline jobs. I will also, in the follow-up email, include a real deep dive. Katie Pace Miles did a webinar for us. She really dove deep into the data, a little bit of the why and what she saw, at least in the New York City school system. And I think that could probably answer a lot more questions. Tony, what do you think were some of the big areas? Because I know from a systems level, you probably have some. Yeah, um, the first inequity started with technology and how do we get the technology into the hands of all of our kiddos? And then if they have technology, do they have Wi-Fi, right? And um, how many kiddos are in the house? And how, once we get you the laptops and work with the city to get some technology, is it the bandwidth to support four kids in a house, right? So th that was the basic, right? To, 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 to get technology in kids' hands. So th there, there were, there were many things, right? Many of our parents are, are frontline workers. Where do, where do the kids go while, while you're working? Do they, you know, go to grandmoms? Some of them. Can grandma really help you? At, you know, your five or six, can grandma help a five or six year old? Maybe some grandmas can. I know my mom couldn't help the kids, but, <laughs> um, you know, could grandma or whoever caregiver help kids to get online? It, it was, it was a lot. This and then what about fine motor skills? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like where, you know, developing that muscle to do that writing. It's so many things. I, I, this is clearly, uh, this would take us off to another line of thinking, but I wonder if in the classroom, some of those differences were erased. And if that, uh, so the extremes of uh, accessibility would be within, would be erased within a classroom, or if it got to be the point where it was a different schools in different settings. And when you talk about a student who has a pool at home and a, another student who is in, what did you say, in the rest area of a, I, I don't remember what that was, but I'm just wondering, Ben, about how those inequities are emphasized through isolation and how they are erased through, um, through a classroom situation. So that's a thought and another conversation. I will tell you that with uh, Katie's webinar, she kind of drew a comparison chart based on research and found that math gains, she did it by grade level, you know, which grade levels were hit hardest, which SES groups were hit hardest. Um, but she was also able to show that math gains are a little bit easier to remediate um, due to the pandemic than reading gains and kind of what that acceleration looks like after the pandemic. Go ahead, Damien. Thank you for a great question, by the way. Hey, um, so as we're talking about inequities, it immediately makes me think about and understand the value of making sure we know our students because we can't get caught up in the appearance of an inequity where one may not necessarily exist. Um, perfect example, someone who may be on the lower end of the, uh, of the poverty scale may still have a very involved parent. They might be working extremely hard, but they still might find a way to make themselves available to support them with their homework. And on the flip side, you could have somebody that's on the opposite end whose parent is never around. And so the appearance of privilege, the appearance 
of there being an equity is doesn't always fit neatly. So, but but again, I think that's why it's important for us as educators to make sure that whatever level we're on, we need to make sure we know who our students are because the more we know about them, the better we can relate and the better we can relate, the better we can support them when we have a full holistic understanding of, of who they are. I, I couldn't agree more, Damien. I mean, we, we talk about that all the time. If, if I don't, if I don't know you, I can't teach you. And, and you know, I, I think we have so many fabulous teachers who really get to know their kiddos. And this, you, you brought me back also um, to what we were talking about earlier with the, the language-based disabilities. Um, how often do we hear some teachers say things like, he's so lazy. If he would just be more motivated, it, that's an appearance thing. And, you know, the dyslexia, the language-based disabilities, none of that has anything to do with intelligence, right? So we do have to be careful of all of that. So thank you for making me think of that. No, I got to jump in because your timing is impeccable. Just yesterday, I sat in on an MTSS meeting, and this was one of the few times that we actually were able to have the parent available to come. And one of the issues is almost similar to what you described, where the, the, her particular son was having challenges with understanding some element of the text. Um, come to find out, he has a language issue, but we didn't realize how significant the language issue was until mom came in to explain it to us. But to add another level to that, mom has very, you know, she has a hard time speaking English. So it was a challenge just in terms of the staff member that we had who was able to interpret, was able to gather that information to be able to explain it to us in a way that was 100% consistent with what mom said, and then be able to use that information to parse it out and figure out how do we provide the right supports for this particular student. But if had we never gone that extra step and said, okay, let's get mom in the room so we can really get a thorough understanding of what's going on with the student, we would have missed out on this. And that classroom teacher would have still continued with that perspective of he's lazy, he's not trying, when it has nothing to do with effort, and it's all about a, 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 particular, a, a separate issue that can be very easily addressed. So much good information. I will I'm also add, <laughs> oh, go ahead, Jill, let's hear I'm it. Sorry, this, is, this conversation is so fascinating. Uh, I worked as an independent tutor and oftentimes a parent and child. The first, issue, the first meeting was always with a parent or caregiver and child. And often the adult would say he's hard headed, doesn't try hard enough. And with further probing, the parent is describing his or her own difficulties. And it's the first time that they've begun to understand that that child didn't uh, get these def difficulties just out of the air, but genetically uh, through, through their parents. And that was a big breakthrough for the parents to be more empathetic with the child. So it, most often it was, uh, it was around reading and kids working in school. And one more thing, and I will go you, is when I was training tutors, one of the things that a, uh, a trainee said was that people will often uh, admit to, that I suck at math. No one says I suck at reading. It's so laden with shame and uh, kids learn that very, very early. So I just, thanks for all the work you're doing. Hi, I would just like to add that if we look at our children and have them look at themselves through the correct lens, that I think that that's so beneficial. I call my children kings and queens. I was protective of their well-being. I think that that's important. They didn't have an option according to my world, you know, now, and they believed me. You don't have an option. This is what we do. And you just build them up. Sometimes if we have high expectations of our children and we have high standards and we have a relationship, which is even more important than the rules, because if you have a relationship with your children and they trust you, 
they'll do just about anything that you ask them to do, or they'll put forth that effort, but they, they have a sense. There's a second sense that if you think I can't, then I won't because I don't have to. So I think that just protecting their well-being, having high expectations, looking at them as if it's 10 years from now and what they're going to need and providing that and having a mindset that together and the family, I don't care what the, the background of the family is. My experience is that parents want more for their children. They don't want their children to be less than they are. They want their children to thrive. And we have to embrace and value the families in order to make the progress that we have to make with these children. That feels like a great place to note that we've got about one minute left. Um, I love ending on that note. Um, if there are any final questions or comments from anyone that you'd like to add here at the end, we'd, we'd love that. Um, also, uh, as you're thinking of any last minute questions or comments, um, we'd love to just thank uh, our two presenters. This has been a really wonderful session and very much in the line of, of how we like to have, uh, a, you know, kind of uh, structure our lunch and learns with great presentation followed by a great discussion. Um, Kimberly Garrison, I see you've got your hand up. Hey, everybody. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I just wanted to dovetail off of the last two comments, which um, was an example um, ben Carson, whose politics I'm not about, but whose story is fascinating and represents his mother, who was illiterate. Um, but she was able, despite her own shortcomings in terms of literacy, was able to inspire and motivate her sons to become two prominent um, people in our society. Uh, ben Carson, as you know, is a, is a world famous a uh, doctor and surgeon, and his brother is an engineer. So I think that really empowering our parents um, and giving them those those tools and those tips and the tricks, um, and also that they can they can inspire their children despite whatever their limitations uh, may or may not be. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you again to Tony and Megan. Um, really appreciate your time and sharing your insights with us. And also thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I put in the chat uh, just a minute ago, um, a note about our next Lunch and Learn happening. Uh, oops, I did not put the date and time in the chat, but um, it is happening uh, in a, just a few weeks um, on April 12th at 4 p.m. So we're gonna do a little bit of a different time for our next Lunch and Learn, just to give um, perhaps uh, folks who work in schools or parents uh, a different time of the day to, to join. Um, so we'll be discussing uh, Emily Hanford's Soul to Story podcast. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, but once again, Megan and Tony, um, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Have thank a great day, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye, thank everybody. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye.